Holiday Park United Methodist Church. I welcome all those folks in the sanctuary here as well as our YouTube audience at home. Thank you so much for being here. Hey, it's Father's Day. Please give the fathers in our congregation and at home a round of applause. Come on. Give it up. It is Father's Day. Thank you so much. All right. Well, let's get right to it. Everyone is welcome at the 830 service, the 10 o'clock this one, and of course our 6 p.m. service. Please attend one of those if you are able. Uh, Sunday school is available after the children's sermon at the 10 o'clock hour, and nursery is available for babies through two. News and activities, please go to our webpage or our Facebook page. Information is there. Okay, our Philippi work mission crew has left the building. Been waiting a long time to say that, a couple of years actually. Uh, they left, they were uh, commissioned here at the uh, early service. Please keep uh, the work mission team in your prayers as they go for uh, obviously uh, good work, safety, for weather. Please keep the people in Philippi in your prayers, those that we might contact while we're down there. But uh, we're glad to be back after a two year hiatus. All right, so Vacation Bible School, please go to our web uh, website or our Facebook page. Please register uh, your children, one each for, e uh, one for each registration. It is July 25th to the 28th. Uh, if you would like to help and volunteer, please call the church office and Melanie will get your name to Lucy uh, McGuff. She can give you a call and see where we might be able to place you, but please uh, do that. Uh, also, if you've been tinkering with the idea of becoming a member of the Holiday Park United Methodist Church, maybe you have questions about it, don't want to join yet, but you have some questions, want to join, we have three membership classes that will run consecutively on three Sundays in July, the 10th, the 17th, and the 24th, 6.30 to 8 o'clock p.m. in the evening. Uh, there will be a rehearsal dinner. Yes, it's going to be dinner. It's a Methodist church. Come on. Uh, for you to uh, know what you're to expect on July 31st, that will be the day, the Sunday at 10 o'clock, that you will uh, get, uh, take your vows of membership. So. Uh, again, if you would, if you're tinkering with any of those thoughts above, please call the church office so we can register you and uh, know how to prepare for the classes. So, with that, uh, we did say it's Father's Day, didn't we? And we didn't want to forget you. Uh, we wouldn't forget you, but uh, uh, we know how important uh, the lives of fathers are uh, in their families and, of course, uh, to their children. So, uh, please, uh, please watch this video. Good job, Lauren. Okay, I got it. Dad. Okay, don't forget to carry the one. Dad. Okay, that was delicious. Thank you. Right, hold on there, kiddo. Dad. The cheese. The there you go. Okay, just one more. Hold your trophy up a little bit higher. Good morning, good morning, good morning. It's time to rise and shine. Dad. I love it. Um, no. Dad. Dad. And they were here first. So Dad. We... So you want to go catch a movie at like 7.30 or something? <sighs> Dad. And one more. Okay, one more. Wait, 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 come on, just one more, one more. Dad. I'm so proud of you. Now you just gotta get a job. Dad. You look beautiful. Oh, Dad. 
uh, and stand just a little closer together and move just a little bit to the left, uh, my left, uh, a little more. Dad! We do celebrate the fathers and the men in our lives who have been like fathers and have nurtured us. We have another video to watch today. Today is June 19th. It's also known as Juneteenth. Juneteenth is a day that is considered African American Independence Day. It is a day that is considered the oldest known African American celebration. It's also a day that many people have not heard about, but I invite you to listen to this video and not only receive a history lesson, but help us to recognize this important day as well. This world is one great battlefield with forces all array. If in my heart I do not yield, I'll overcome someday. Like the Civil War itself, slavery didn't end with one decisive act. After the Battle of Antietam in September 1862, President Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation in January 1863. It declared all persons held as slaves within the rebellious states to be free. Northern abolitionists welcomed the proclamation as a first step, while Southern slave owners ignored it. Ending slavery would take a constitutional amendment passed in January 1865, Robert E. Lee's surrender at Appomattox in April 1865, the heroism of many enslaved families, and the Union Army itself to personally deliver the news to the most remote corners of the conquered Confederacy. The proclamation that Lincoln signed didn't find its way into Texas, which is where my father's family is from and the Rambo family until mid-June of 1865. On June 19th, Union General Gordon Granger arrived in Galveston and personally delivered the news. The people of Texas are informed that in accordance with the proclamation from the executive of the United States, all slaves are free. This involves an absolute equality of personal rights and rights of property between former masters and slaves and the connection heretofore existing between them becomes that between employer and hired labor. There was a, a lot of celebration, but there was also a lot of sadness, a, a lot of concern, a lot of fear. Both enslaved Africans and those who held slaves didn't know what really to do now. As freed Americans, where were we to go? One hundred and fifty years later, June nineteenth is a day of remembrance and celebration. I think my first Juneteenth celebration was when I was six or seven because I remember roasted ears of corn, and this was in Austin, Texas. And then coming here, I was surprised and really astounded to find out that Minneapolis, St. Paul, have such a strong connection with Juneteenth. It stands to reason with the number of people who probably migrated this far north who brought with them that tradition. Every year in Texas, Minnesota, and around the country, Juneteenth is marked with music, food, and fellowship. We are celebrating at Mississippi Regional Park. There's all ages here. I just see all kinds of people and colors. <laughs> it's amazing to me that, especially among 
uh, the African American culture, we have a little bit of a fear of, of embracing that history, you know, because there's some shame connected to slavery. I don't feel that way. I feel that that is such an important part of who I am as a person. The strength that I have within me comes from that struggle. African American Independence Day. So we're celebrating yep. our day of liberation, our day of liberation. It's important to have opportunities for us to celebrate our oneness, our wholeness, our completeness, our dynamic selves. It's vital to African American people to have a, an opportunity, a date, that heralds the importance of who we are as a people, and what we've been through as a people. Juneteenth gives African American communities a chance to reflect on their ancestors' struggles and achievements, and also to spotlight current issues. There is a lot going on in this world. There's a lot of anger, a lot of frustration, and a lot of uneasiness. The foundation you have can kind of give you a little bit more of a sure footing because you can look and say, well, wait, my family made it through this hatred. Somehow they made it through. Yeah, so take that strength and go up to the next level. I love seeing the support that I get every year. It's always new people I'm meeting and hopefully collaborating with them so we can have Juneteenth and not let it die. It's so important. If in my heart I do not yield, I'll overcome someday. At this time, I invite you to stand and let's join together in the call to worship. A word spoken, a voice heard. A dream revealed, a mission received. God calls again and again. God beckons us to follow. To love, to serve to give again and again. God invites us to embrace the lonely, to feed the hungry, to tell the good news of Jesus, to love and serve, and to sing praises all our days. Let's join together in our first hymn, God of Grace and God of Glory.
Let us join in the opening prayer. Lord, Lord remind us, us that we must be the church if we are to be the church in mission. Help us to continue to grow in the likeness of Christ by the empowering presence of the Holy Spirit. Only by continued growth in him can we be released for mission to the lost, the poor, the broken. We would be instruments, O God, of extending the ministry of Jesus and his kingdom for your good pleasure. To serve you all our days is our heart's fervent desire. Amen. We have Stella and Henry and Miranda, and I don't know your names. Um, Theo. Theo. Elise. And, and who? Elise. Elise. And what's your name? You don't have a name. Okay, the mystery man among us. Well, I'm glad you all are here. Question for you. What is the most important job in the world? It's a trick question. What do you think is the most important job in the world? Do you think being a mom or a dad is important? Yeah, it's an important job. How about being a doctor or a nurse? Think that's important? Mm -hmm. Being a firefighter, yes. Police officer. Police officer, yes. Those are important jobs, but it's not the most important job. The most important job is one that anybody in this room can do, and it's something that each of you can do too. Love, that's, that's part of it. Hmm? Pray, that's part of it. Keep going. Telling people how much God loves them. Now, you guys are mugging for the camera here. I can see you're watching there. You need to be paying attention. Loving God is the most important thing that any one of us can do. And you can do that through loving each other, through praying for each other, and through coming to church, not only to learn how much God loves you, but being able then to go back from church to tell people how much God loves them. Now, we had a bunch of people here this morning who were getting ready to go to West Virginia on a mission trip. And they, we had a prayer with them, and some of those have, people have already gone on their way. Some will be going a little bit later on today and tomorrow. They're going down to help a lady whose house is in need of repair. And while they're there, they're going to tell her about Jesus. And they're going to show how much they love Jesus by, by the work that they do. In just a few minutes, we're going to have a baptism here. And this baptism is so that the family can teach their baby about Jesus so he can grow up to learn about Jesus and how much God loves him. Now, I'm going to ask Zach and Jesse, will you please come here with your baby? This is Zach and Jesse Nelson. No relation, but I would claim you as my own. Um, and this is their baby, Isaac. And Isaac is going to be baptized by his grandpa and Grandpa and mom and dad and all of us are going to have the opportunity to teach Isaac how much Jesus loves him so that he can see from the way we act and what we say that he's very important not only to his family but to God as well. That's our most important job. Okay, you guys can go back and sit down. That's the most important job any of us have to do. So we're going to have a prayer, and then you'll be able to go back to Sunday school with Miss Vicki. Um, but remember, the most important thing we can do is tell people about Jesus. Let's pray. Thank you, Jesus, that we can tell people about you, that we can experience your love through the caring and the love of other people, 
in our families and here in the church and even the neighbors around us. And thank you that we can celebrate Isaac's baptism today and have an opportunity to remind him as he grows up how much you love him and that we care about him too. Help us in everything that we do and say and think to be pleasing to you and help us always to remember your love. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. At this time, I would like to reintroduce to you who may not remember this. Hang on just a second here, Bill. This is Reverend Bill Starr. He was your interim pastor for a number of months over this summer, and we're glad to have you back, and we're proud of you for being here to preside over this baptism. So it's welcome. It's wonderful to be back. Okay. Members of the household of God, I commend Isaac to your love and your care. Do all in your power to increase his faith, confirm his hope. And welcome you in Christian love as members together with you in the body of Christ and in this congregation of the United Methodist Church. On behalf of the congregation, we present to the congregation Isaac Zachary Nelson for baptism. Thank you. These are the questions for you. Zach and Jesse, on behalf of the whole church, I ask you, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin? Do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they may present themselves? I do. Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in His grace, and promise to serve Him as your Lord in union with the church which Christ has opened to people of all races, nations, and ages? We will. Will you nurture Isaac in Christ's holy church? that by your teaching and example, he may be guided to accept God's gift of grace for himself, to profess his faith openly, and to lead a Christian life. I will. Please join me in a moment of prayer. Heavenly Father, water has played such an integral role in what we know about you and your relationship with us. Creation was started from the dark deeps. You were with your people as they crossed the Red Sea and the Jordan River. Your son, Jesus Christ, was baptized in that same water. And Lord, rather than give us something expensive and extravagant to remember and spend, you gave us water, common, ordinary water that we recognize as the substance of life. That is our reminder of our relationship of love and peace and joy and grace. That is something that every day reminds us whose we are and who we can be. May this water be a blessing upon Isaac. May it be for all of us a reminder of our baptism. And may we all be blessed again and again. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
here's where I would normally ask your full name. But Isaac, Zachary, Nelson, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And Isaac, may the Holy Spirit dwell within you that you may forever be a true disciple of Jesus Christ. Amen. Members of this household of God, I commend Isaac into your love and care. Do all in your power to increase his faith, confirm his hope, and perfect him in love. God of all grace, who's called us to eternal life in Christ, establish you and strengthen you by the power of the Holy Spirit, that you may live in grace and peace now and forever. Amen.
please join me in an attitude of prayer. Lord, it's so good to be here with you today. In the beauty of this place, with the multiple celebrations that we have this day, with your spirit holding us and helping us to focus on you. There are so many reasons you give us to say thank you to you for your love, for your provision, for the people around us to encourage us and support us and remind us of your grace and forgiveness and the salvation that you so generously offer. There is nothing that we have and nothing that we can do or be without you. Thank you that you give us a story to tell about how much you love us. Thank you that you give us people to talk to and to remind about how much you love them. Thank you for the practical ways that we can work with you to provide for people's needs in our homes and in our families, with our friends, with the people in Philippi, West Virginia, and with people whose path you cause us to cross in our neighborhoods and at work and where we go to relax. Thank you, Father, for the new day of life that you give to us. Thank you for the people who you put in our lives who are blessings to us and who remind us to continually turn to you for the strength and support of each day. Please give us the courage to follow you into your day. Lead us to fit into your plans for us. Please help us to stay close to you, to follow your will and to obey your word. Please help us to always be mindful of the people who don't have the opportunities and privileges you have given to us. Please cause our prayers, dear Lord, to be a blessing to them. Lord, please be with those who are sick and struggling. Please heal them and grant them your peace. Please deal with those and help those who are in grief, who face what seems to be insurmountable mountains, and who struggle to know the next step that they should take. Direct them by your Spirit. Surround them with your love and enable us to reach out to them as your witnesses and provide for them what you direct us to give. Lord, please forgive us for our sins this past week. Help us to forgive those who have sinned against us just as you have forgiven us. And help us to receive the forgiveness and the salvation that you offer. Please make our hearts clean again so we can serve you and so you can use us as your witnesses no matter what our age, no matter what our circumstance, enable us to tell everyone we meet about your love. Help us to always put you first. Lord, hear our nation's, our prayers for our nation and for our president. Please bless our president and our government leaders in their decisions that they might be obedient to you and to your will. Please hear our prayers for the missionaries who serve you throughout the world. Protect all those who have faith in you. Protect them from harm and from persecution and from hunger. Please provide for all of their needs and protect them from the evil one. Please bring your peace to the people who live and suffer from unrest and injustice. Please protect and provide for refugees from many different countries. And please bless the land of Israel and the lands all around Israel with your peace. Lord, help us to pray. 
Help us to pray not just with our words, but with our actions in our lives. And as you give us opportunities to pray in the events of our day, and as we hear sirens and as we see needs, please bring your presence and your justice to those situations. Please make what we say with our mouths be what we believe in our hearts and demonstrate with our lives. Lord, we have so many things to talk to you about. And as we come to you with our prayers, hear our prayers in Jesus' name. And bless us as we pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us all to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. You may have noticed when you came in that the offering box moved. It's over on the other side of the sanctuary. If you missed it, you will still have opportunity to give of your tithes and offerings. If you need to give online, we certainly encourage you to do that. These tithes and offerings that you give on an ongoing basis are used not only for the furtherance of God's kingdom on earth, but to support the ministries of the church that we celebrate each day, all of which give glory to God. Will the usher please come forward? We are reminded that we are to pray continually for each other. And so, Lord, we lift up these tithes and offerings to you for your blessing, for your glory, for the furtherance of your kingdom. And we pray for those who have given out of the abundance with which you have blessed them. We ask, Lord, that you fill each one with the knowledge of your will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding and lead each of us to a life worthy of you, pleasing to you, bearing fruit in every good work and knowing beyond a doubt of the extent of your love and your salvation and your provision for each of us. Bless these tithes and these offerings that we may indeed be ministers of your word and give glory to you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Pat, thank you for the invitation to share this time. Congregation, it's good to be back. And uh, this is probably as good a Father's Day as anybody could have. Uh, all the family are together, the Stars and the Nelsons, and, uh, and extended families beyond that. And uh, to share in that baptism is a special gift. Scripture for today are just a few verses from the book of Colossians, and, and it's not so much the total content of the book as it is just a few words. I'll explain in a moment. But beginning with verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, 
and Timothy, our brother, to God's holy people in Colossae, the faithful brothers and sisters in Christ, grace and peace to you from God our Father. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray to you, because we've heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all God's people. The faith and love that spring from the hope stored up for you in heaven and about which you have already heard in the true message of the gospel that has come to you. In the same way, the gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the whole world, just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and truly understood God's grace. This is the word of God for the people of God. Ed, if you'd just put that first verse up there again, please. A religious scholar by the name of J.D. Wald has suggested that there are four words in, this, in these first two verses, particularly the second verse, that sort of catch the picture and the frame of everything that Paul is saying to the Colossians in this book. The four words are in that second verse to God's holy people in Colossae, the faithful brothers and sisters in Christ. In Colossae, in Christ. The question is, which of those two phrases is going to be the picture and which is going to be the frame? Will this Roman city, Colossae, with its culture and value system, dominate the picture and invite Christians to surround it with a little bit of baptismal window dressing? Or will the in, Christian, in Christ ones, the Christians, supply the art with the context of in Colossae serving as the frame? I, I found that to be a very thought-provoking idea. And so I, I want to share some more about that with you. Colossae was about 100 miles inland in what uh, the western part of what is modern day Turkey. And it was a wealthy city, a Roman city, uh, well known as a geographic and political center at its height. It uh, happened to be right at a pass through which Xerxes and Cyrus had to come if they were going to do anything serious uh, to the west from Persia. Rome used it as a garrison. It had a, a couple of main commercial strengths. One of them was wool because the volcanic and earthquake activity caused it to be a very fruitful place and, and they had herds of sheep everywhere. So there was wool for the, that was known throughout the entire world. And because of the river there, the water had a particular way of making wool take a dye. And so they were known for their dyeing. Once a prosperous and vital city, it sort of fell apart. At the time of Paul, it probably wasn't a whole lot more than just a small town. Perhaps the smallest town to which Paul had ever addressed a letter. Paul didn't found this church. It wasn't likely that he ever visited this church. It was probably part of the eastern expansion from Ephesus. It was mainly a Gentile church rather than a Jewish church. And as you look at some of those verses and read through the pages of the, book, of the letter that Paul wrote, um, you read that there's a lot of good about it that Paul is lifting up, but there were some problems too. There were some heresies going on. Gee whiz, where aren't there problems and heresies going on? One that attacked the total adequacy and unique supremacy of Jesus Christ. That was, that was the key. One that denied that he was son of God and son of man. One that denied that he was fully human and fully divine. You know, just a man. A teacher, a rabbi. That was the key heresy. 
And for that, through the rest of the book, Paul lays out a very high Christology, talking about who Jesus is, lifting him up, but also stressing the humanity of Christ, the, the love, you know, uh, without knowing actually what I was going to speak about, Pat hit it on the head with the kids about the greatest thing we can do is to love God and, and of course, one another. The heresy was full of astrology. I hope you're not reading your daily charts. <laughs> it was, there was information in it about the powers of demonic spirits, the principalities and the authorities. You see, there was a whole lot of legalism going on. And at the same time, the moral values were eroding away. Boy, that's just so familiar today, isn't it? So Paul was asking if the Colossians were going to really live as if they're in Christ, or were they going to choose to live like in Colossae? What was going to form them? What was going to be most important to them? In every age, from the first century to the first, 21st century, and probably every century before, there were, there were really just two choices. Who were you going to live in favor of? And for the Christian era, it's whether you're going to live in Christ or in Colossae. There's a prevailing religious system, and there's real Christianity. You know, just rites and rituals, and then there's actually love. The prevailing system sometimes just mimics what Christianity is, gives some hat tips to God and, and public invitations and some Judeo-Christian social customs but it's only really offering a palatable civic religion. And the question isn't really whether we live in Colossae or not, because we have to live in Colossae. We have to live in Murraysville or, or Plum or Homer City or Warren or Tappahannock or Miami or wherever we happen to be from. The question is whether we will live in Christ or not. Will he be the picture or will he be the frame? And this is the awakening that we all have to have. We all have to have this awakening from our disgruntlement with the insanity that's going on around us. Think about everything that we've been through with the COVID, the political intrigue that goes on, the violence that's in the streets, the issues that are being raised. When we finally get so frustrated with that insanity and, and discontent with how it's twisting and turning us inside. When this awakening becomes greater and greater within us that we need to be in Christ and find a way to live in Christ that it will lead to the awakening that becomes much greater and greater around us as well. Listen to this statement. The things that stand in the way of my truly comprehending being in Christ and living by Christ's grace is that I'm pretty sure I already comprehend it. Listen to it again. The things that stand in the way of my truly comprehending being in Christ and living by God's grace is that I'm pretty sure I already comprehend it. I hope there are red flags flying. The gospel is a message consisting of very specific words, but it's more than a message. The gospel is truth, but it can't be confined to a group of propositional truths. We can't simply outline and, and fit it into a box for ourselves. Before the gospel is anything else, 
The gospel is God. Let me explain a little bit more because gospel means good news and the good news is God. Not that God loves us, that's just something that he does. The good news is that God is love. That's who he is. The good news is not that Jesus saves, that's something that he does. The good news is that Jesus is salvation. That's who he is. And you see, it's a whole lot more than just the things that we do, but it's that message that Pat just gave to the kids that the most important thing that we can do is to love, because God is love, and receive what Jesus is himself. Receive him. Be in Christ. We think sometimes that we truly comprehend God in the gospel because we have some idea of the things that he has done for us, right? We think we know what he has done for us. That's good as far as it goes, but it doesn't go nearly far enough. When our understanding of the gospel is limiting, limited to only what God has done for us, our understanding of sharing the gospel is going to be telling other people what he's done for them. Not who he is, not who Christ is, not who living in him is. To be sure, that's part of what the gospel means. But the gospel is absolutely who Jesus Christ is to us and in us and through us. It's not a body of knowledge about who, is, who God is and what he's done. It's knowing God. In John 17, verse 3, Jesus prayed, Now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and him who you have sent. It didn't, there's no word about in that verse. It's not know about you. It's know you and the one you have sent. We're living in a period of world history where the measure of mastery has sort of become uh, what we know about a subject and getting the experiences and the degrees to prove it. You know, to, be a, to, be a, to have a master's degree or to be a doctor, PhD. The Christian faith isn't meant for this method. Real Christianity can't be reduced to knowing about God. We have to know God. And to think that we can master the subject of God is the ultimate idolatry. That's why I read that statement twice. Real Christianity is about understanding ourselves as subject to God and becoming mastered by Jesus Christ, being in Christ. So the gospel of Jesus Christ is not God's solution to our sin problem. The gospel is that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ Jesus, not counting our sins against us. It's about the relationship through which God lives in us and we in him. It's not just knowledge, but it's knowing. It's not just a body of information, but it's the person of Jesus Christ. Knowledge is good. I'm not gonna knock knowledge, but it's only a penultimate good. The ultimate good is knowledge about God giving way to knowing God and being in Christ. And when that happens, that last verse that was in today's scripture. The good news is bearing fruit and growing in the whole world so that it has been bearing fruit among you from the day you heard it and comprehended the grace of God. To become real in Christ, to become a real in Christ Christian then is our aim. That's what you have promised for yourself 
when you were confirmed or joined a church, that's what you promised to provide for Isaac when we baptized him here on your behalf today? Not to teach him about God and Christ, but to be God and Christ with him. To, to show him who that is in his life. It requires us to humble ourselves and confess that we're just not quite there yet. Not that we're not on the way, but that the way might just be a whole lot more than we ever comprehended. And Wald asks that question, which will be the picture and which will be the frame? Will your life be the love of God and everything about God and Jesus Christ and living in him, knowing him? Or will it just sort of be dressing the outside and showing up in the fringe? Being in Christ takes a lot of work. But that's what the gospel is, no less. And we can't pretend it's otherwise. We are in Christ or not. And the choice that he obviously died so that we could make is to be in him. Which will be the picture and which will be the frame? Pray with me. Father, we thank you for your son, Jesus, who's both the way and the way maker, the life and the life giver. He is the truth, not a construct of knowledge, but a person, the word made flesh. We want to know Jesus more, more than we want to know about him. We want to know him personally and intimately and powerfully. And to this end, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.